there will be some distressing scenes. I include them because eternal punishment in hell is still being preached in Liverpool today and I think church leaders ought to reflect on what they're doing to people with some of the uh, images they come up with. So I take it seriously. Now personally I do believe in some kind of life after death but I think eternal hell is, I would count it as the most socially destructive theory ever invented by the human mind. I, uh, if you can think of a worse one, let me know. But um, if I believed in it, I would be too terrified to give this talk. So a bit about myself. When I was six, one day, on the way home from school, my elder brother, who was seven and therefore knew everything, explained that when people die, the good ones go to heaven and the bad ones go to hell. Ooh. What about me? He reassured me. When children die, they always go to heaven. By the time we got home, I had thought it through. I told my parents my decision to commit suicide forthwith. <laughs> As you can see, they persuaded me not to. Apparently, I was too young to understand the reasons to me, the logic still works. When I was 12, I was in a boarding school accommodated with evangelical house parents along with seven other boys. We had two Bible expositions a day. One day, we had this one. Whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit can never have forgiveness, but is guilty of eternal sin. Apparently, this meant eternal punishment in hell. I was petrified. I was the whole of 12 years old. I couldn't remember whether in all those years I had ever blasphemed against the Holy Spirit. Added to my terror was a puzzle. The other seven boys who had heard this didn't seem bothered in the slightest. Why not? So I asked my parents, they told me not to worry, apparently I was still too young to understand. I must have been a horrible child. Now why do I say hell is more fun than heaven? Augustine, early 5th century, I have a lot to say about him. What will I do? There will be no work for our limbs. What then will I do? Is this no activity? To stand, to see, to love, to praise. Giotto's Last Judgment. There they are, doing what Augustine said, at the top and in the middle. But if I ask you, where's the action? Where is it? It's, you know, your eye is caught to the, the fun bit, isn't it? In the middle of that bottom right-hand corner, we have... This is the devil excreting a sinner. Lochner's Last Judgment, 15th century. Again, where's the action? Memling's Last Judgment. Don't worry, I'm not going to go through all of them. Also 15th century. The saved on the left, the damned on the right. Now, you can see hell engages the imagination. Alice Turner's book on hell. The concept of heaven is instinctively understood as a metaphor, an inadequate attempt to, to convey the bliss or ecstasy of the soul dwelling in God's grace, rather than a real address with pearly gates, harps and halos. 
hell, the place of punishment for sinners, has always been taken much more literally, perhaps because it's easier to understand. If heaven is spiritual, hell is oddly fleshly with tortures that hurt. Heaven and hell are only meaningful when we distinguish between the saved and the damned. Before that, our hunter-gatherer ancestors believed in some kind of life after death. The archaeological evidence goes back half a million years. Why did they believe in it? Probably for the same reasons that people believe today. People find it hard to think death is a complete end. When somebody you love and admire dies, does that mean everything they achieved is now meaningless? And if it's meaningless now, what sort of meaning can it have had before? We live our lives assuming that life has meaning, value and purpose over and above the pleasures of the moment. Most of us. That's how most of us assume our lives work. So a distinction between the saved and the damned appears eventually... Uh, Zoroaster and Plato both affirmed it in different ways. For Jews, it became popular in the 2nd century BC, after the Maccabean Wars. The logic is, the martyrs died for their faith and deserved to be rewarded. And some of their enemies died as well and deserved to be punished. Well, how are you going to reward and punish all these people? They're dead. There has to be something after death. The New Testament actually has different views about life after death. Mark, Mark's Gospel was the first Gospel to be written, and it has one reference to hell. If your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life maimed than to have two hands and go to hell, to the unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life lame than to have two feet and be thrown into hell. And so on. The word translated hell is literally the rubbish tip outside Jerusalem. Hence the references to worms and fires. When Jesus said it, the reference to the rubbish tip would have been obvious. Maybe Jesus was saying something a bit like, if you've got a bad eye and you spend your life worrying about it, you're sending your life to the rubbish tip. If you plucked it out, you could at least get on with your life. It, it's, it's possible that he, you know, he meant something like that. It's Matthew who copies these sayings and adds warnings of eternal hell. Matthew's different. Matthew clearly loves a good punishment. There will be a weeping and a gnashing of teeth. That's Matthew. Even the parable where, Je where Matthew reports Jesus' parable saying we should forgive people, even that gets the Matthew treatment. And, and it ends, this is just the end of the parable. And in his anger, the Lord handed him over to be tortured until he should pay his entire debt. So, my heavenly Father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. Now, that's a bit puzzling, isn't it, really? <laughs> the book of Revelation tells us a lot about heaven and hell. Heaven is described like a church service. Do you still want to go there? <laughs> Angels describe what's, what goes on in hell. This is one of the texts. Those who worship the beast and its image will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. There is no rest day or night. 
Other second century Christian documents describe visions of hell. According to the Apocalypse of Peter, blasphemers will be hung by their tongues over a fire. Women who plait their hair to attract men for fornication will be hung by their hair. And the men who lay with them will also be hung. I won't tell you which part of the body they will be hung from. <laughs> and so on with other sins getting suitable punishments. And there were quite a few documents of that sort. Mercifully, this book was not included in the Bible. Right, so why all this? Islam began by winning wars and becoming the ruling classes. Christianity began with the impoverished and the persecuted. It's typical of people embittered by oppression that they want their enemies to be severely punished. The more, the better. But all they want for themselves usually is relief from the oppression. This is the hell of the martyrs. When I was a curate in Bolton, an elderly parishioner summoned me to talk to her. She had been told she didn't have long to live. So I assumed she wanted to talk about what would happen to her after she died. But when I got there, she wasn't bothered about herself at all. What she was bothered about was the vandalism recently reported in the local newspaper. She wanted me to reassure her that the vandals would be severely punished in hell. About herself, she had no concerns at all. I thought that was odd. I now know it's normal. Augustine set the tone for Western Christianity. By his time, the only people persecuting Christians were other Christians. He was writing end of the 4th century, beginning of the 5th. Um, people still had visions of eternal punishment, but for a different reason. The key is Augustine's doctrine of original sin. When Adam ate the forbidden fruit, now Eve ate it as well, but it's Adam that counts, the entire human race was in Adam. Now, in order to understand what this means, you've got to forget all modern biology. But we were there, in Adam. So we share responsibility. You and I are partly to blame for when Adam ate the forbidden fruit. We therefore deserve eternal punishment in hell. Christ died to save us from this fate, but there are various conditions. Despite the crucifixion of Christ, the overwhelming majority of the human race will still end up in eternal hell, according to Augustine, and this was accepted really up till the 19th century. Hell, which is also called a lake of fire and brimstone, will be material fire and will torment the bodies of the damned, whether men or devils, the solid bodies of the one and the aerial bodies of the others. So it follows that any amount of earthly suffering is justified to save you from eternal hell. And this is how he justified declaring war on the donatist heretics who believed the wrong things. Well, this is no longer the hell of the martyrs. This is Hell is no longer what the persecutors deserve, it's what the entire human race deserves. So we've changed. There have always been people with a gloomy attitude to life, but if we deserve eternal punishment, we must be dreadfully sinful. What developed, especially in the monasteries, is an attitude called contempt for the world. Central to this contempt was a strong sense of guilt about sin. 
Sexual temptation was the most common theme, but they often felt guilty just for enjoying the ordinary pleasures of this world. Nice food, pretty clothes. The most popular account of hell in the early Middle Ages was the vision of Tundale, written in 1149 by an Irish monk. This illustration comes from the 15th century. So, an angel showed Tundale round hell. Tundale's at the top left and the angel next to him explaining things. I don't know whether you can see, but there's people diving into a lake of fire there. Um, elsewhere, the angel reveals one type of torture after another. I'll spare you the details. Um, when it comes to inflicting pain, the human imagination is incredibly fertile. Do we all really deserve all that? It just doesn't seem right to give eternal punishment to people who are a bit evil, but not that evil. Purgatory makes punishment temporary. Limbo has two uses. One is for good people who lived before the time of Christ. The other is for babies who died before they were baptised. Augustine was adamant that unbaptized babies would be sent to hell. Others refused to believe it. There must be somewhere else for them, limbo. Trouble was, neither purgatory nor limbo are ever mentioned in the Bible. Well, what I've mentioned so far is, um, was for the religious, really. Um, before the 14th century, most people were not gripped by hell. Not that much, anyway. The devil was a figure of fun. There were lots of stories about humans tricking the devil. The mystery plays were fun. Here's Alice Turner again on the mystery plays. Has anybody seen the mystery plays in Chester or anywhere else? Some of you have, yeah. Um, they leave out the toilet humour these days. The, 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 the originals, the demons had a lot of trouble with flatulence. Um, but we don't pay attention to that. So this is Alice Turner's comment on, on the mystery place. Hell was everyone's favourite part of it. A scaffolding achieved by something as simple as a ladder might stand in for heaven in an early production, but even in the very, even the very earliest plays we know about give careful stage directions for infernal scenes. The 12th century Mister Adam uh, specifies chains, clouds of smoke, clatter of cauldrons, kettle drums, and so on. So that was, you know, it's hell that is interesting. But then... What next? The Black Death. From the middle of the 14th century, for 300 years, there was a series of plagues throughout Europe. They had an immense effect. Now, this 300-year period includes the Reformation and the Counter-Reformation. So Catholics and Protestants alike have good reason to take offence at everything I'm going to say. You may have visited old cathedrals and seen tombs with an image of the dead person on top, looking like that or like that. You know, very, uh, you've, you've seen them, right. Here's a French one from the 15th century. It depicts the rotting corpse. Um, uh, the eyes are sunken, you can see the rib cage. Uh, you probably can't see from there, but there are worms eating the flesh. This is called a trancy. When so many people were dying that it was impossible to bury them all, rotting corpses would have been a common sight. The message is, one day you will look like that. Now, um, cast your mind back to something else. I guess most of you have attended at least one funeral. Think of the cemetery chapel or the creme, the 
um, chapel of repose in the funeral director's premises. What's the ambience? What sort of pictures are hanging on the wall, if any? They're designed to give a feeling, come in, of respect and peace. Calm and tranquil. You wouldn't expect to see this. Or this. These are dance macabres. Both 15th century. When everybody knows that even if they're in perfect health, they might be dead in a week's time, it makes you reflect. What is life? What am I living for? Is God angry with us? So, all that contempt for the world that had become commonplace in the monasteries began to make a lot of sense to ordinary people. All over Western Europe, pictures of judgment and hell were painted on church walls. Now, we in England don't see so many because the Reformation, they all got rid of them. But until they did that, every time you went to church, you would be reminded of God's judgment and the threat of hell. It wasn't just the future. If a just and righteous God is going to torture sinners, godly governments should do so too. So they did. This is a German news sheet of 1603 describing the execution of two teenagers found guilty of murder. They began by stripping the two boys and they whipped them in such a way that their blood abundantly covered the ground and the executioner stuck red hot irons. How much of this would you want to know about? <laughs> There's lots more. There's lots more details. Um, but at the end, it says, boys and girls attended, as well as a great crowd of adults. In this torture, one and all admired the just judgments of God and learnt from this example. Well, I could provide any amount of gory details, but I assume you want to sleep tonight. We have an even more gruesome account from a little earlier, a chap called Felix Platter. And he describes another torture and death, and he ends his report by saying this, I myself was witness to his torture, my father holding me by the hand. You just think of that little boy. Making children see these tortures was considered a moral lesson. After all, they believed this was how God treated sinners. So who is going to avoid hell? Who's going to be saved? There was uncertainty. Official Catholic doctrine reaffirmed by Calvin was predestination. God has decided about you before you were born and there's nothing you can do about it. But the sale of indulgences presupposed that what matters is how many sins you commit now. The wars against the heretics implied that what matters is what you believe, whether you have the true faith. Whether you have the true faith, at what moment in time? Well, presumably when you die. A new literary form developed in the 15th century, the Ars Moriendi, the art of dying. Savonarola, popular 15th century preacher, has this to say. 
Man, the devil plays chess with you and he does his utmost to capture you at this point. Hold yourself in readiness, therefore, and think well on this point, because if you win here, you win all the rest. But if you lose, all that you have done before will be worthless. Now, these conflicting theories about who gets saved and who gets damned, they left uncertainty. Even though the majority was destined for hell, every individual could hope that they would be saved. On the other hand, nobody could be sure. One thing was absolutely clear to everyone except the Anabaptists. If you weren't baptised, you would go to hell. So, what happens when you give birth and the baby dies before being baptised? Augustine was quite clear that child is going to hell. In parts of Europe, they had sanctuaries of resuscitation. You take the baby's body to one of these places, you light candles, say prayers, celebrate masses, and you wait. At some point, the baby's body will move in some way or other. That's the moment. The baby has come back to life. Quick, do the baptism. Baby will die again afterwards, but won't go to hell. Just imagine being a mother going through that with your baby. Well, this age from roughly from the 14th to the 17th centuries. This was the age of the witch hunts, the Spanish Inquisition, the rise of atheism, and stories about people selling their souls to the devil. Suppose you're an unmarried mother or a father who cannot feed his children. The local priest or minister is quite sure that God will punish you in hell for eternity. You may well wonder, is there anybody else up there as far as you're concerned, even the devil can't be as bad as God. Better still if there is no God at all and no life after death. Jacques Le Goff, that medieval historian. Unless we bear in mind the obsession with salvation and the fear of hell that motivated the people of the Middle Ages, we shall never understand their mentality. So I said quite a lot about that period of time when hell was at its most dominant. Eventually that tragic age came to an end and since then belief in hell has declined. Preachers of hell would occasionally tell their congregations, in my sermon I'm trying to frighten you. This is because I too am frightened. The biggest religious story of the 19th century was the increasing number of educated people who rejected Christianity. The main reason was that they couldn't believe in hell. The controversial book Essays and Reviews, published in 1860, contained two... Has anybody heard of Essays and Reviews? Some, yeah, right. Well... It was controversial at the time. Two essays by Church of England clergy who didn't believe in hell. So there was a court case, they were prosecuted. How can you be a clergyman who doesn't believe in hell? And the court case went on and on and on. And eventually concluded that whatever the church's doctrine, it was legally permissible for clergy not to believe in hell. So of course church leaders were all the more determined. <coughs> These doubts about hell were not universal. The educated classes might disbelieve, but they wanted to make sure their servants did believe, otherwise they would disobey. And the same applied to children. Victorian parents often gave their children books describing heaven and hell. 
The most popular were the books by the Roman Catholic priest Joseph Furness, first published in the 1860s. There were 14 of them. They contain descriptions of children suffering eternally for their sins. I'll just quote one. This is, they're basically printed down versions of talks he gave to children. Here's the bonnet of fire. It is pressed down close over her head. It burns into the skin, it scorches the bone of the skull and makes it smoke. Think what a headache that girl must have. She is wrapped in flames for her frock is on fire. There she stands burning and scorched. There she will stand forever burning and scorched. When that girl was alive, she cared only for one thing, and that was dress. And now her dress is her punishment. He must have been a bit odd by our standards, but these books sold in millions. In other words, millions of parents deliberately bought them because they thought it would be good for their children to read this. Well, what's wrong with all this? My view is that it doesn't work. And I'm going to go back to Lochner. How are we doing for time? All right, so far. Right. Um. Right. Now, on the left there, I am reminded of Freshers' Week at the university. At the bottom, I don't know whether you can see it, these two here, an angel with an arm round one of the people queuing up. So let's, I've got a detail, there we are. Yes, don't worry, you're in the right place. When you get to the front of the queue, someone will tell you what to do. I guess we could all imagine being that angel. You can imagine yourself doing that. Suppose you were delegated to do the other angelic job. To drive the damned into hell. If you had that job, what sort of expression would you have on your face? Would it be something like these? Or would it be more like this? And what about Memling's St. Michael? There's Memling's triptych. Now, St. Michael is the one in the middle there, at the bottom. Let's look at his face. If he was applying for that job today, he would have to say he was passionate about punishing sinners. Is he passionate? Do you think these might get the job? That's the problem. The artists face an impossible job. The theology is all wrong. The demons perform two roles. They are both God's enemies and God's agents of punishment. They can't be both at once. If the tortures of hell are God's judgment, God is just as hostile to us as the devil is. Nothing wrong with the devil. If they are the devil's doing, contrary to God, then the devil is more powerful than God. Put the whole story together and somewhere along the line you have to include the impossible. Holy, cuddly, obedient servants of God driving people to eternal torture. Hell is, in my view, is built on that contradiction. In modern debates about how the law should punish, there are three main approaches. It's a bit more complicated than this, but these are the main three. Some argue that punishment is there to deter. Some that it should have a positive aim of helping the offender live a better life. Purgatory is often described as a process of reform, preparing people for heaven. That would be a, a reform thing. 
But if hell is eternal, it must be, the only possible explanation is its retribution. Now, the idea of retribution is to put right the moral balance after an offence has messed it up. It's a requirement of justice. This is a kind of metaphysical concept of justice. Justice demands that sin, uh, offences must be punished. So, on this theory, the theory of retribution, punishment should be not too little and not too much. When it has been completed, when the punishment is completed, the moral order has been put right again and the moral status of the offender has been put right again. This theory, retribution, influences penal punish policy today, but it's far from being the whole story. You can think of lots of uh, exceptions. So it leaves us with two problems. One is that we don't have to accept it at all. One common religious theme is that God is calling us to overcome our selfishness and to do good for the sake of other people. If we are to be punished for our offences, then every good act also becomes a selfish act. So we can never quite get away from our self-centeredness. Perhaps retribution just expresses an evolved instinct for retaliation and revenge, and we will be better off resisting it. The other problem is that if retribution makes any sense at all, it has to be commensurate with the offences and leading up to whatever happens next. Theologians who defend it usually appeal to Augustine's doctrine of original sin. Now, one immensely influential book along these lines was John Stott's The Cross of Christ. Has anybody come across it? It's nearly 30 years old now. Right, well, this is a good example. Um, it's in order to justify eternal punishment, it stresses that we are all very, very sinful. We really do deserve eternal punishment. But you might ask, well, are we really that bad? So that's the question. Now I want to conclude on that kind of note. It seems to me that this is just my way of responding to this. Hell appeals to the worst elements in human nature. We enjoy thinking about the punishments inflicted on our enemies. It's fascinating. But it also instills fear and oppresses people traumatizes people. Heaven has kind of two roles. One is that those who believe in hell need a kind of foil, they need an alternative. Okay, you're so horrible you're going to hell, what's going to happen to me? There must be somewhere else. Um, alternatively, heaven can be nothing to do with hell, it can be just a general word for the afterlife if there is one. It can transcend the tradition of dividing people into the saved and the damned. Well, my own view, for what it's worth, is that our hunter-gatherer ancestors were right. They believed there must be some continuing life after death. We don't know what it's like. What we do know is that the forces maintaining our present life are beyond our understanding. In order to get on with our lives, we have to trust them. Maybe we should trust them for whatever happens next. So I'm going to stop there. Um, there's um, a bit of time left. Um, here are some questions you might like to ask yourself. Um, so do you want to um, stop and talk for a few minutes? And I'm happy to take questions. <laughs>